Great. Hey. I'm Walter Isaacson. I'm the one you don't know, but this is Lisa Monaco, who you've been waiting to hear. And she, of course, is the assistant to the president for Homeland Security. But more importantly for this conference has been every step of the way with the creation of the National Security Division. So let me walk you through that right away, because sure. you were deputy chief of staff, and then I think chief of staff, to Director Mueller mm -hmm. when this whole thing got started. Tell me from your vantage how it got started and what you were thinking then. Uh, well, first, it is great to be here. Uh, happy anniversary to <laughs> NSD, and it's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces and former colleagues. Um, so when I was, as you pointed out, at the FBI, I was Deputy Chief of Staff and then Chief of Staff to Director Mueller, it was right about the time, uh, as you all know, NSD was getting stood up under the very able leadership of Ken Weinstein, who I like to joke, I've basically been stalking my <laughs> entire career. He, of course, was also Chief of Staff uh, to Director Mueller and then AAG and then uh, was one of my predecessors in the job I currently hold. Um, what, from the FBI vantage point, or from my vantage point at the FBI, NSD was getting stood up as the actual structural manifestation of one of the biggest transitions we undertook post 9-11, which was, of course, the, um, the dismantlement uh, of the wall. Uh, I'm fond of saying there were structural, cultural, uh, legal manifestations of that. And NSD was one of the best, I think, structural manifestations of it, bringing the law enforcement folks, the attorneys, intelligence folks together. And what you saw in that is both the relationships individually, because obviously Ken, having been at the FBI, having been a US attorney, an assistant US attorney, uh, knew exactly what it took to bring those people together, the intelligence, the investigators, the law enforcement, the uh, prosecutors under one roof to really understand and tackle uh, disrupting threats using um, a whole range of tools. So you saw that in the personal relationships as Ken was getting it stood up with people like Pat Rowan and Matt Olson, also my former colleagues from the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., many D.C. AUSAs, I think, current and former here. Um, and uh, then you saw the manifestation of that in the relationships that would happen on the cases mm -hmm. between the FBI agents, between the intelligence analysts, between the prosecutors. All of that, it was a very exciting time to see that getting manifest uh, in NSD. And I think to uh, the great good credit of the, both the architects from the WMD Commission to stand it up and from uh, the original folks who were part of setting it up. And then you moved to Maine Justice as Assistant Attorney General, uh, after you're confirmed. And did it look any different when you were on the other side of the fence? Well, again, to the great credit of uh, folks who uh, then took the mantle from Ken and from Pat and then David Chris uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration, it felt very much like something that was firing on all cylinders. And when I became Assistant Attorney General, um, one of the things I was very focused on was making sure we were A, continuing all the good work that my predecessors had done, and B, um, making sure we were fulfilling the vision that NSD um, in its design and in statute uh, and across the missions that it had to perform was really taking root. And I saw that in uh, a couple different forms. One, being what I called operational lawyers. Right, Not folks who kind of sit in the ivory tower and say, well, you can't do that because that would be a real problem. Um, but helping the operators get to yes, but get to yes the right way. Find a way to do something that is both consistent with the law, consistent with our values, and getting after the threat. Can you give me an example of that? Sure, tons of examples. The lawyers who represent uh, the intelligence community before the FISA court were constantly creative uh, under the leadership of Tash Kahar and now Stu Evans and uh, countless others. They were being constantly innovative in tackling extremely complicated problems, working in the best tradition, I would say, of the Justice Department, um, honestly, candidly, creatively representing their client before the court. And so I saw them doing that constantly. In the terrorism prosecution realm, when I was Assistant Attorney General, we underwent a whole series of cases. We were very much dealing with um, using the legal system as one of our critical tools in our quiver for disrupting terror threats. So that is extraterritorially bringing 
uh, terrorists back here uh, to face justice, but making sure we were getting intelligence out of them first and foremost. And that required a lot of very both creative lawyering and uh, I think very focused approach on things like the Warsami case. My first day as Assistant Attorney General after being confirmed, I remember this vividly. Uh, George Toskis and other will, others will remember this. Sitting around the conference room table, doing, um, uh, making sure that Warsami, who was uh, uh, Al-Shabaab and AQAP facilitator, was being brought to the United States to face justice. And working with uh, other prosecutors in the Southern District of New York making sure that would happen, working with the FBI agents on disrupting homegrown violent extremist threats. Well, let's go back to Osabi. Uh, how did the creation of the NSD division and the sort of uh, way that process changed when you created it change how you would have handled the Wasabi case? So what you saw, um, what ended, the function NSD performed is You've got the prosecutors in the National Security Division, the prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office working the case, the FBI agents and intelligence folks all coming together to oftentimes um, uh, carry out a very complex uh, set of um, things that had to happen mm -hmm. to bring that disruption uh, operation to fruition. So in the case of Warsami, he was uh, taken into custody by our military um, overseas held on a ship for two, uh, nearly two months, just over two months, um, and given um, uh, uh, humane treatment, visited by the ICRC, um, and uh, debriefed by the FBI, debriefed by intelligence folks, and we were able to, A, satisfy ourselves that there were no other terrorist threats, get a tremendous amount of intelligence from him, and then bring him to face justice in our courts, he ultimately pled guilty, serving a lengthy sentence. You saw all of that come together. The place it came together was in the National Security Division. It's kind of the umbrella, looking at the policy issues, looking at the intelligence issues, and making sure the case was going to get prosecuted. So when you moved to the White House as the assistant to the president, and you're sitting basically in the Situation Room or the Oval Office whenever anything is happening, what factors do you consider in that building that you would not have considered in the main justice building. So it's uh, what you learn when you go down, travel the very relatively short distance, but it's vast um, between the Justice Department, as it should be in the White House when it comes to criminal cases. But it's a big government. Mm -hmm. And um, the considerations you have in the situation room table are going to be different and, frankly, uh, more varied and more expansive than they are in the conference room table in the National Security Division. Uh, spaces, uh, and that's appropriate. That's right. Give but, me an example, though, where you have a factor you have to throw in that you wouldn't have thrown in at the NSC. There are foreign policy considerations when you are dealing with cases that have tremendous uh, impact, both on how we are using our counterterrorism tools, uh, as well as our diplomatic uh, relationships. Case in point, um, the Arbab Siar case, also that was undertaken during my tenure at NSD. This was an individual prosecuted, um, now serving a 25-year, I believe, sentence um, for uh, being a um, conspirator in an effort to uh, plot to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States, Adil al-Jubair, the then Saudi ambassador, and being directed by um, uh, members of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps and Iranian military. And um, that is, in addition to being, as was mentioned at the time, something out of a movie plot, also has incredible... It was Cafe Milano in it. It was I mean, Cafe what, Milano. Yeah, what a set for the movie plot. So next time you go, Walter, you need to no, no, look no. under your <laughs> chair. But um, it, was, it was both uh, a complicated plot and a complicated prosecution and a set of considerations about getting intelligence from that individual applying our principle that intelligence first to make sure we're just taking every action we can to disrupt plots. And this and was during the Iranian negotiations? This was, it preceded that. This was in 2011. This was um, uh, shortly after uh, I was confirmed in the fall of 2011. And, but at an extremely sensitive time, uh, as is uh, often the case uh, with the Iranian government, um, and uh, it was both a Im very important case to bring because it was a crime uh, being committed uh, and a safety issue, 
but it was also important to show that we were going to take action to address Iran's malicious activities. And in that case, they were crossing a red line by undertaking, as we alleged at the time, undertaking a um, destabilizing, potentially extremely destabilizing activity in addition to being a, a plot to murder a, a foreign diplomat. So those types of considerations and how are you dealing with the diplomatic uh, considerations, the fallout, the intelligence issues that were present in that case to make sure that we could use that information in a criminal case without um, uh, violating any uh, sanctity of sources and methods. All of those things come into play that the head of the National Security Division and the leaders there have to think about that come into play at the Situation Room table on a much bigger uh, kind of grander Explain scale. Explain to me how this process you created for counterterrorism translated <laughs> to a similar, if I'm correct, process when it came to the new threat of cyber. So um, one of the other things during my tenure is very focused on, in addition to the operational lawyering and making sure NSD was fulfilling its role as the pol one of the things it's envisioned in its governing statute is being the policy voice in national security for the Justice Department at the Situation Room table. David Chris did it before me. John Carlin now ably does it for the Justice Department sitting at the Situation Room table. But the third thing I was very focused on was making sure we were looking over the horizon. Uh, at NSD and making sure we were able to meet the next generation of threats, national security threats. And so uh, we set up the National Security uh, Cyber Specialist Network, which really was taking a page out of the terrorism toolkit, designating uh, assistant U.S. attorneys across the country um, in each office, just like there is a, a similar person in each office or set of persons for counterterrorism work to be that focal point, both for the FBI on national security cyber investigations, as well as for the private sector. And this, I think, has been incredibly important. And, and John Carlin has done a great job with his team taking this to the next level, being a place where the private sector can go and reach out to and say, we think our lunch is getting eaten, and we need somebody to help us out. We need um, uh, you all to help us uh, and uh, you know, combat this. And what we've seen is a breaking down of, quite frankly, another wall, which is a willingness on the part of the private sector to increasingly share information about these breaches with us because they see there's going to be folks held to account. Um, now, in three cases I can think of on cyber, <laughs> you actually followed this whole process and decided on the consequences, whatever. I think with the PLA in China, mm -hmm. the North Koreans and Sony, and uh, the Iranian Guard, you had a case that happened. Is this the type of process you expect to continue? Absolutely. This is a framework we've now set up, um, much as we've done in the counterterrorism realm, where um, A, uh, we are developing the intelligence, using a whole array of intelligence and law enforcement tools to get the information about the bad actors, just like we did over the last decade and a half in terrorism coming together as a government, intelligence, diplomatic, military, law enforcement, say, let's look at this information. Let's lean forward in what we can use, understanding we're going to need to retain the ability to continue to gather that information. Um, and then let's pick which tool amongst the tools we have in our toolkit is the best one to disrupt whatever that threat is. The, in this case, cyber threats. That's the tool, that, that is the framework we have applied, I would argue, to extremely good effect in combating counterterrorism, and that's what we're doing in the cyber realm, and I think you'll see that continue to play out. Focus on uh, and use all of our intelligence and law enforcement tools to identify the bad actor and make very clear that we'll use the full range of tools to disrupt those threats and hold uh, the bad actors to account. You're going to see we're going to get better and better at it, uh, and you're going to see that play out again and again. Um, does that mean we'll see it play out with the hacks that we've seen recently that have been attributed on the DNC Olympics to actors that may be in Russia? I would say folks should stay tuned because we, we will, stay tuned we, will for what? <laughs> uh, we are going to, again, continue to use these tools. Look, we know 
Russia is a bad Russia is a bad actor in cyberspace, just as China has been, just as Iran has been in the cases that you mentioned. Um, and we're going to apply this framework. Nobody should think that there is a free pass um, when you're conducting malicious cyber activity, just like they shouldn't think there's a free how, pass how on terrorism. How quickly do you have to apply the framework for it to be effective and a deterrent? It's now been a few months. So um, I think you can argue that round or flat. Um, you know, there is, it depends on ultimately what some of the response, uh, what the responses are. I think our, um, our reach is long. <laughs> we, uh, as we've seen in the terrorism realm, right? Uh, it, sometimes it takes a long time to build a case, um, but it doesn't deter us from continuing to pursue it, um, nor does it, I think, deter the force of the message that we are going to continue to pursue those bad actors. And is uh, being public about it um, one of the tools in the toolkit, or is that something? Uh, sure, uh, sure. I think um, we've seen value in that. Uh, we've also seen value in taking other steps, diplomacy. Um, you saw with the uh, work we did uh, with the Chinese. Um, when I was the Assistant Attorney General for National Security, we began that case uh, against the five members of the PLA that was started in around 2011-2012. Uh, then, um, ultimately, it came to fruition under John's leadership, uh, and uh, they came forward with those indictments. That, I think, prompted some serious responses, right? You saw, uh, and I think we saw a diminishment in the Chinese level of Chinese activity. Uh, uh, and then you saw us engage in what I would argue was some very productive diplomacy in the agreement that the president and President Xi um, hammered out now almost exactly a year ago. And is that working well, it seems to be? I think it, we will continue to monitor it. Uh, the point is we've now got a framework. They've signed up to it. We have said we are going to continue to monitor compliance with that. And we've got an ongoing dialogue. But is there a sense that the Chinese are complying? I think we've seen a diminishment in the activity. But I wouldn't say um, you know, that that means we're going to stop watching. And should we expect the same process with Russia? I think you should expect the application of the framework that I've talked about and that others have talked about. Um, and one of the things we have been able to do is up our pace. Right? So um, in the case of Sony, um, it was through exceptional work, I think, and relationships built up by the FBI, working with the folks at Sony Pictures, able to develop information, quite frankly, even before um, the uh, public outing of North Korea in that case uh, happened or before the sanctions, the FBI and the US government and DHS and others were pushing information out to the private sector that was derived from that work that the Bureau did uh, with Sony Pictures so that um, other companies could take action to protect themselves. That is another, I think, often unsung benefit mm -hmm. of the muscle memory, I think, that we've been able to build up in this space. You just said, though, we're upping our pace. Explain that. So w they did that very, very quickly. I think within 24, 48 hours um, after um, this was revealed, the, or that the, uh, the, the breach happened, they were able to push information out to uh, have people protect their systems. And then you saw us move forward uh, with the uh, kind of public naming and shaming, if you will, ultimately the sanctions activity, et cetera. So that is, that's going to, I think, only continue to get better. We're going to continue to hold And that will continue to get better even in the case we were just talking about, the Russian cases. I think, as I said, I'm not going to get ahead of mm. it. I'm sure at this stage there's been all we're manner of record, formulations yeah. of the, I'm not going to get ahead yeah. of the investigation, but I will talk about the framework um, that we've applied and that we're going to continue to, to run how, that play. How sure are we when we identify actors? I mean, it would seem to me as a lay person <clears throat> that we should be able to do, I mean, surely we're smart enough to know who did it. Well, I think that I mean, cyber experts who are smarter than you and I uh, mm -hmm. in this room uh, would, uh, would tell you that uh, it's a very complicated endeavor oftentimes. So you're not absolutely sure that we have a case to be built yet, if that's why you're being not getting ahead of your skis on Russia. I'm not saying that at all. OK. But um, I, also, <laughs> I also took off my lawyer hat when right. I walked down the street from uh, the Justice Department uh, to the White House. And what does that mean? There are other factors you have to consider? 
I think there's a whole set of factors that the investigators and the prosecutors consider. And we leave it to the investigators and prosecutors. It's not a political White House component in this. Well, any time an enforcement action is involved, that is going to be, first and foremost, a function of the independent investigative agency that's doing it, and in these cases, the FBI, and the prosecutors at the Justice Department, the National Security Division. That, um, and having spent 15 plus years in the Justice Department, I can say that is a, um, a line that is rigorously observed, as it should be, that yeah. those judgments, the is there a case and is there a prosecution and a decision to prosecute, whether you're talking cyber, criminal, terrorism, white collar, that is appropriately made. Even a foreign made. government. Absolutely. That is made in the, um, in the Justice Department as appropriately it should be. Where the discussions happen, and our Barb Sierra is a good example of this, um, how do we address the diplomatic issues that flow from that? How do we address the potential retaliatory action of a foreign government or a foreign actor? Um, and what are going to be the foreign policy, the intelligence, the military, the diplomatic considerations attendant to that prosecution that is being uh, independently developed uh, and made? Well, thank you. That's a very you know, fascinating analysis. Let me open it up. If, yes, sir. You can speak up and I'll repeat, or the mic runner will find you eventually. Here we go. Uh, my name is Walter, and I am an immigrant long time ago from Poland. And uh, I wonder what the national security do, including your office and, and Obama administration, when national security advisor advise administration to vet it, vet it, the new immigrants to come to this country Somehow they are ignored that they say, no, no problems. I came to this country. The first things I had to question from Poland, they asked me, have you belong to the Communist Party as a youth? OK? And I say, no, because I never believed that system. That's why I escaped. The question is you. Why don't we can ask question those immigrants who come over here? Take only one. Takes only one to sneak in. Ask him if they have an association with Arcadia or with a terrorist group? Good question, Lisa. Mm -hmm. So look, the, um, the refugee and asylum and other vetting process is extremely robust, um, as it should be. Now, um, there are also a host of good national security reasons why you want to um, continue to have the United States be a beacon for refugees and immigrants. Uh, I'm the daughter of a first generation Italian American. I believe very strongly that we ought to continue to be a beacon and a welcoming um, uh, entity for uh, from immigrants, refugees from all over the world. We've got a responsibility to rigorously screen and vet um, refugees, immigrants, and, and um, for a whole host of reasons, I think we carry out that responsibility. The Justice Department, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the intelligence community does that um, and is ex uh, expending uh, a great uh, amount of resources in order to do that. I think that's appropriate. You saw the announcement uh, just yesterday that we will now um, our target to take 110,000 uh, refugees uh, over and above the 85,000 from last fiscal year. That's important. The president's going to convene a refugee summit of um, uh, dozens of countries from around the world at the UN General Assembly next week. That is important. We're doing our part to be a welcoming um, country to the refugees that have been um, uh, flowed out mm -hmm. of horrible conflict uh, in Syria. In the way back, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, Linda Sykes, uh, recently in the Washington Post, there was an article about the uh, El Salvadorian that was in the Can you point to the flight to the flight? A 19-year-old in Montgomery County by stabbing him 40 times. Uh, there was another one about a uh, guy that had been arrested. Yeah for uh, heroin in uh, the Eastern Shore, and uh, he'd been deported five times. And your ICE and uh, DHS organizations reported in the last year that 60% of their deportees are serial deportees. How can we get control of this constant Good question. Flow Why don't, yeah, Lisa? Yeah. So um, we've taken a lot of uh, measures to try and address, uh, you're talking about probably southern border um, um, security. 
and uh, you know, stepped up border uh, patrol, stepped up um, the uh, efforts along the southern border. Mostly, I think what we, what we need to do and what we are continuing to do is work with both the Mexican government, the El Salvadoran government, the Costa Rican government, the triangle there that has um, had such incredibly uh, difficult security and economic problems that is prompting a flow of um, uh, folks to our southern border. So we both have to continue to harden our border, um, uh, our southern border, but importantly, continue to work with um, the South and Central American countries that whose security situation is actually prompting uh, a flow and stop it before it gets to our border. I have a last question because they've given us a signal. Mm -hmm which is to maybe ask you to reassure us and talk to us a little bit about the election process, which is uh, you at the, uh, at, your, at the White House and also at DHS, they have a critical infrastructure list. And we know that if a country in peacetime attacks our electricity grid, they've attacked a critical infrastructure. And I assume we have a doctrine mm -hmm. to deal with it. My question is, um, is our electoral system on, or should it be on, a list of what is our critical infrastructure? If somebody tries to mess with it, will we retaliate? And what confidence level do you have that our election system can't be messed with this time around by cyber? So uh, all good questions, so we try and take them um, in succession. One, um, I have a great deal of confidence in the resilience of our election system, um, not only of our democratic process, but our actual election system. Um, it, Director Comey has spoken to this and I think has put it pretty well. Um, our election system by constitution and by administration is really um, owned, operated, and administered by state and local county municipal governments. Um, that makes it extremely disparate, extremely diffuse, and as a consequence, extremely difficult to have a effect across the board that would uh, result in um, a, a change in result. That well, wait, said, wait, 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 yeah, I don't quite get that. I mean, if you're saying that in, um, you know, a particular county in Florida is mm -hmm. controlling it all, yeah. and if they get messed up, it doesn't really matter, I'm not sure <laughs> the digital chads yeah. still yeah. make me comfortable. Yes, um, well, one is, it is, by and large, it's not actually hooked up to the grid, right? So it's not hooked okay. up to the internet. So that's one point. But to have a um, to have an effect that would alter the outcome would be very difficult. Um, and this is what we've we've discerned both the experts in the critical infrastructure focus from DHS, from the FBI, and others. So that is that is one piece. What I do think we need to worry about is uh, efforts to sow kind of concern or confusion about the resilience of our system, which is why I will continue um, to be very clear that I think we do have a resilient structure. It is largely because of A, it's not hooked up uh, by and large to the internet, and B, because it is so diffuse and in so many different hands. Um, but uh, the efforts of malicious actors to um, intrude upon voter registration databases uh, and other elements of our critical infrastructure as well as our voting infrastructure is of concern, which is why one of the things we're doing in addition to looking at this question of designating it as critical infrastructure, regardless of which way that goes, what folks should know is we are, in the form of the Department of Homeland Security, pushing out to state and local governments, to secretaries of state across all of the states who have the job of administering the electoral infrastructure, a whole set of tools um, that they can avail themselves of from the experts at DHS. Ability to scan their systems to determine vulnerabilities and quickly patch them. Uh, a set of best practices that they should apply to their uh, systems, encrypting their voter registration data, et cetera, um, making sure it's not hooked up to the grid. So a whole set of best practices and tools that they can apply, but they've got to be willing to do it and it's all in the state control. Uh, so I think that, that does not change regardless of whether you call it critical infrastructure uh, or not. Lisa Monaco, thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it.